great pleasure, uh, after many years of knowing um, Dan Brown in Kings, to have a chance to talk to him about his life and work. Dan, can you start by saying when and where you were born? So, Alan, I started in Glasgow, at least in a smaller town just outside mm. Glasgow, but Glasgow was... Mm. Uh, what was the a small town called? It was called Gifnock. Gifnock. Gifnock, yes. Yeah. Strange name. Mm. People in the West, the West End of Glasgow used to, when you said where you came from, they sniggered a little. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, apparently had, it was on the south side of Glasgow, and the development side. That's uh, hmm. uh, an unnecessary comment because hmm. uh, it was it's a it's a human anyway. comment. <laughs> it's a human comment, and we want lots <laughs> yeah. of those. It was on the road to Kilmarnock, and it hmm. was great. Um, my father. When when were you born? I was born in nineteen twenty three. Nineteen twenty three. Yeah, I and will be eighty five in a month's time. Oh, congratulations! <laughs> I've reached that point. Um, your father was... My father was a restaurateur in Glasgow, um, not of his own wish, but his brother, having been killed in the First World War, my father, his elder brother, my father perforce took on uh, his father's business. And his father's business had been around, I think in 1947, it had been in Glasgow, not exactly in the same uh, building, but in Glasgow for 100 years. It was in that sense well known, and I've met people in New York who claimed that... Uh, was this called Brown's? It was called Daniel Brown's Limited, ah. Daniel Brown Limited, uh, in St. Vincent Street. Where, but uh, people said, yeah, we used to court there. And things like that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it was not making money. After the war, uh, it's slow, it's, it was not making money. And um, it kept going for quite a while. But my father didn't persuade myself and my brother to go into it. And we didn't even think of it. There what? was a point when I was a graduate student, a couple of years later in, in, in London, the work wasn't going well, and I said, this is a very depressing business I've got myself into. Can I come back and help you? Fortunately, he dissuaded me. He had, in fact, been an engineer on the Clyde during the First World War, and... Uh, not in Brown's shipyard. <laughs> <laughs> I think not, somewhere in Govan, though, uh, I believe. Mm. I know nothing about that, mm. apart from what he told me when he cycled from work, uh, from home to work, from Pollock Shields to whatever, Govan. The fogs were so bad that you put the wheels of your bicycle into the tram lines, mm and guided yourself to work that way. Uh, but I knew nothing about that side of him, really. What sort of man was he? He wasn't always very well, mm. Stomach also. Mm. An intelligent man, he had some very good friends. He worked uh, well, and... Um, did he, did he inspire you? I mean, you say he was an intelligent man. Was he a widely read man, or...? I don't think he was widely read. But he was always interested in what I was doing at school, so we would do geometry together. He would uh, be interested in any mathematics I was learning. And uh, my mother, of course, having been a teacher hmm. for a short period, knew more on the English side, and that was a good mm. start for me on that side. But we didn't actually have a great collection of books in the house. He did give me The World of Science by Sherwood Taylor, quite a fat book, 
So he clearly understood my interest in that direction. And it was evident when I went to school in the Glasgow Academy and there came a new teacher of chemistry that I was quite inspired to do chemistry. I was obviously better than anyone else in the class, mm. but I could understand in a way that none of others appeared to. What school was it that you went to? The Glasgow Academy, mm. which was in the West End, of course. Mm. So we used to travel by train every day. Mm. It was a pretty good school, I imagine. Yeah, there were the three or four very good schools in mm. Glasgow, mm. Glasgow High School, Hutchison's Grammar, and uh, a variety mm. of schools. Mm. It was it was a good school. The, the chemistry teacher suggested to me that, or to my father, that I might sit for a scholarship in Cambridge. Now that would imply taking another two years at the school, coming back and starting to learn some Latin, which I started to do, and. Uh, but in fact, rumours of war and then war, uh, in effect, uh, wrote that off altogether. Just uh, it, the idea vanished, and it wasn't a very strong idea in my mind anyway. So I went to Glasgow University. Before just before leaving school, did you have any particular hobbies at school? That you, I mean, a lot of scientists seem to be bird watchers or collecting fossils or. Um, interested in music or games or sport. Were, were you interested in any of those sorts of things? I don't think I was. No. I don't, I don't think you just I worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> Are you interested in music? I have become so, hmm. yes. And that was rather dependent initially. Well, my mother was helpful here. And subsequently, when I got to the university, uh, my, my closest friend, who I see every twice a year, that is at the 80 Han now, Zurich. Um, it was in his house that I heard of these big, what were they, 78s yeah. records, yes. Yes, yeah, the, the Beethoven quartets and, uh, and the piano sonatas, some of them anyway. And I suddenly realized there was something out there that you know, I essentially knew nothing about. But when I finally got to London, I started to listen a good deal more. Mm. Okay, well, let's so go I, back to Glasgow University. Yes. Um, you, you went up at what age, at the usual age? Well, the usual age in Glasgow being uh, 17. Was 17. It, I think it would be mm. 17. Yes. One took one's fires. Mm. Yeah. And there was no entrance exam, they one mm. went. You know, mm. that was it. Um, and that was fine. But the war arrived, mm. and the interesting system at that time, which I, I think looking back was quite important, was that if you were doing well, i.e., getting a first every, mm. at every examination that happened along mm. the way. Um, you could stay, and you were always looked at by someone, I think a professor of chemistry who came from London. And um, Rather than going off to the war? Rather than going off to the war. Mm. Well, if you didn't uh, get a first mm. every time, of course, you did go off to the war. Yes. Now, it's interesting that while I was at Glasgow Academy, for some reason, I did not join the OTC. Yes, you know, the Officers Training, training Corps. Corps. Mm. Um, with half a dozen others. I don't remember being, in any sense, pacifist. I think my father was, though. Mm. Well, in the end, mm. he didn't use that term, mm. actually. But mm. Was he of a religious persuasion? Of it? I have never known him to go to a church oh. at all. And uh, my mother took me along sometimes. It was, it was uh, Presbyterian United, something or other. Yes. And I actually still retained from that time 
a liking for a good sermon <laughs> and not, shall we say, the kind that we have in the chapel here, which only last for ten minutes. Mm. I actually did. You liked a solid hour. A solid bit of, uh, well, not necessarily <laughs> an hour. I don't think I was uh, too involved with that. But, um, Do you say, uh, what, but provided, you know, a philosophical background mm. to what it was about. And, mm. I, you know, I found that interesting. Are you a chapel goer now? Or? No, no, I'm not. No, no, I'm, I'm of course, entirely... Agnostic or atheist? I'm entirely atheist, yes. Atheist. yes. And always have been, mm. yes. Mm. But, um, of course, I... Go to the ca chapel occasionally. I go to the chapel and the school. We sang mm. hymns before at, uh, you know, um, at assembly and we did it so. <laughs> mm. One has a feeling for some of the ritual, though, ritual in Kings, the chapel, I find it goes far beyond what I like or was interested in. Mm. You think there's too much ritual? Yeah, and also, y yes, of course. The you like the car carol service, presumably, and so on. I do. I, I like to listen to mm. the choir. I don't do it very often. But, uh, um, and in fact, choral music isn't really the thing that uh, that I feel terribly strongly. Mm. I started at one point going to uh, the opera mm. when I was in London, mm. uh, subsequently, but um, I am much more interested in piano and quartet and, yeah. and good or orchestral music. Mm. Well, let's, let's get back to Glasgow University. Um, were there any teachers or co you know, co people you were studying with who you particularly remember as being influential at that time? Chemistry teachers or any other teachers who inspired you? Interestingly, I would say there were not hmm. within the staff of the university chemistry department hmm. and physics at that time or as it was called, natural philosophy, mm. was dropped, was, uh, was even less interesting. Mm. But they were good teachers. Mm. And one had, and the important thing was that uh, one lived one's general life during the day in the lab that you, uh, you know, where you had your bench. And, uh, The lecturers' rooms were through the lab, so that they always had to pass through it in order to get to their room, and that was the time you could talk to them, mm. ask them about things, about their lectures, about this and that. There was no supervision beyond that, and that was not really supervision, that was up to us to ask mm. questions. Mm. We, and it became clear to me when I arrived here, that the supervision system, uh, at least in the sciences, did not really expect much reading. Mm. Whereas that is how we derived our information. I did, in fact, join the Chemical Society, which is now called the Royal Chemical Society, uh, ChemSoc, in 1942, I think my second year, uh, for something like five pounds a year, mm. for which I got the entire journal, uh, monthly, and one or two other things, from which I learned chemistry at the time, the subject that was being worked on by people, um, good papers, were nevertheless understandable by students at our level. Mm. among the organic chemists at least, mm. which of course does not hold them out at all. Mm. Papers, uh, if you've been out of touch with that bit of the field, become almost meaningless to you. Mm. 
So I was very fortunate at that time mm -hmm. learning. Yeah. So but, you, sorry. But the the head of the department, a man called G. W. Cook, uh, was a good chemist, and he had been at the Chester had been associated with the Chester Beatty Research Institute in London, the Cancer Research Institute. And he had been involved in the chemistry of carcinogens. In fact, the carcinogens in coal tar soot, yep. that kind of source, and the extraction from a ton of that, whatever it was, let's call it coal tar, um, of several pure crystalline compounds, which when rubbed on the back of a mouse, created a tumour. Mm. This was the work with the man called, because, shall I say that uh, when I had finished in Glasgow, he suggested, well, there might be a job with the Chester Beatty Research Institute. I became a research student there. Mm. The head was a man called Ernest, or E.L. Ken Kenaway. K-E-N-O-W-A-Y. Uh, Kello, uh, Kenaway, yes. yes K-E-N-N. A great rationalist, a very serious man, but I got on well with him because he retired while I was there. And I used to talk to him a great deal. I so I was involved then with a man that had done the thing that started what I might call cancer chemotherapy, or mm. cancer, an understanding of uh, carcinogenesis by finding a pure compound <laughs> mm. in nature. The one, in fact, uh, that, um, that, that had been known for a century, maybe even two centuries, uh, and discussed by a man called Percival Pott, called chimney sweeps cancer, mm. where the small boys climbed, uh, cleaned chimneys by climbing up them, mm. and they tumors. Mm. Um, so I think I, I have learned quite a lot, although the thesis I wrote was so dreadful, in my opinion at the time, was this the one at London? In the one at London. Which yeah. which part of London was this? Which university did you go to? Imperial College. Yeah. But one didn't go there. I mean, mm. Chester Beatty was just uh, part of it. I I worked with a man who had been. So you stayed in Glasgow, you mean, or did you go down to London? Oh no, I was in London. Mm -hmm. because I was in London yeah. You went to the Chester Beatty. Yeah. yeah. So your thesis, you thought, was dreadful. Was it? Mm. Who who was your supervisor? For that? Man, doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter. It was... Um, what was wrong with it? Oh, well, you, th you start by thinking that certain kinds of things maybe uh, have an anti-cancer effect, some things in the literature. You start following that up. You make 20, 30 compounds of that kind and in fact, of another one, a very simple one, that somebody had noted while I was there, and I made maybe about a hundred of them. <laughs> uh, but they didn't advance the subject at all, quite simply. And uh, I looked at this thesis again um, a few weeks ago, just to convince myself that it really was terrible. And when I read it again, I discovered, oh yes, that I had, the work wasn't very significant, but I had actually learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew quite a lot about <laughs> carcinogenesis mm -hmm. and this and that. In fact, 
and I had discovered that, among other things, that um, that the genetic material, which was the thing that was clearly going wrong in carcinogenesis, was probably DNA. It, that was the view that was coming through just at that time, um, and not that proteins were the things that were at fault, and um, at least not at fault in the initial sense. Um, and it was for that reason that I went to that the man in London, the new director, said, well, you could go to Cambridge for a little while. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, what you, you did wonder, I think, what kind of things I was reading. And maybe I should just say that with this small group in Glasgow that I associated with, and of the four, one died this last year, but the other three, I'm we're in good touch with each other still. Uh, we, uh, we read, well, we were reading Jean-Paul Sartre at the time. We were, and I was reading Mauriac and Gide. I think we were all reading those. And um, another Frenchman, Duhamel, the Pasquier Chronicles which there was a character, it was, it was a three generation sort of story around Paris. There was a, a character called Laurent, who was a young scientist. And a sister that was a musician and so on. But the important point was, I, I think I really did find that that French literature, which I was reading in translation, of course, had an intellectual content that I didn't meet in reading works in English, shall yeah. we say. Mm. So though I was reading a, a bit of uh, Shakespeare, and in fact becoming very caught up with, the, uh, with Shakespeare's sonnets, but that would not be unusual, I think, uh, and thinking terribly highly of the, um, of the people around 1800, I mean, you know, Keats, Shelley, Wordsworth, that, mm, Wordsworth, and then moving a wee bit into Tennyson, but uh, less important. Uh, I did nevertheless feel that, uh, that the French writers were, they were talking a, a philosophical view of, of, of life, which one of them didn't derive uh, either in Glasgow, London. Hmm. Well, Clearly we were reading other things, of course, at the time. Glasgow, we read uh, C.P. Snow, but then one realized afterwards that all Snow was doing was putting up a set of cardboard figures. I mean, there was no depth to them mm. at all. Mm. And furthermore, uh, uh, he was deriving his uh, characters quite a bit from people he knew already. Mm. Nevertheless, the first, uh, the only one, shall we say, that I really felt for was the one called The Search. Mm. Uh, you may have read it. Uh, it was not part of the, the Masters and all that mm. series at all. It was about, basically it was about his, his own failure as a physical chemist, I think, but he put the failure onto a crystallographer, and that crystallographer was obviously Max Perutz. <laughs> who you who you knew, presumably? No, who I've known for years. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
till he died. Mm. You know, too long. Um, uh, and uh, another individual who was so clearly J.D. Burnell. Mm. Did you know him? I've met him, but, mm. but mm. at that time he had had a stroke, and mm. was, I didn't mm. meet him very well. No. Mm. And he was called, I think, Leo Constantine or some such name, with the mop of mm. hair. And, <laughs> <laughs> but I got a feeling for Cambridge at that mm. time. Mm. In a sense, I've moved into Cambridge now, but uh, I got a feeling for you know cycling home from the lab in uh, uh, seven or eight at night on a on a kind of damp um, Thin evening. winter evening, mm. you know, mm. and thinking, yes. The snow is describing mm. some place or other. Mm. But, uh, the kind of thing I'm feeling about this place, mm. this, a kind of very strong feeling that I found a place that suits me very mm. well. Well, I seem to have jumped back to. Let's let's mm. see how you got from London to Cambridge. That would be interesting because yes. um, you felt your thesis was a. Not much good, but what did you do at the end of it? Uh, did you go on in London, or did you, was that when you came to Cambridge? Uh, I did write the, the I did write that up. I did stay at the Chester BT one further year. Uh, did very little work. I did a lot of reading. Mm. Got interested in certain aspects of nucleic acid chemistry. And let's face it, the subject was actually in confusion, and mm. it really, really was. Um, I can mention that a little bit more, but uh, uh, when the, the head of the Chester V said, go to Cambridge and st stay a bit and learn some nucleic acid chemistry, and that was a suggestion to go with a friend of his, because they knew each other in Edinburgh. Uh, the, the man from the Chester Beatty uh, and uh, Alexander Todd, who had at one point been in Edinburgh. Um, and Todd had made a fairly meteoric rise in the profession. Todd had worked the great chemist at Oxford, Sir Robert Robinson. And then he had moved into an interest, and he had spent a year in um, Edinburgh, a year or two in Edinburgh, with a man called Barger, George Barger. And I found that George Barger had been a fellow of this college at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but Barger was going downhill at that time, and it would appear at least in a biographical memoir that Todd wrote of one of the other people there, he gave the impression that he himself had kind of taken over running the place. Mm. <laughs> but that was Todd's character. Mm. Um, and, but he was learning to work on things that were then of very difficult uh, because they were only present in small amounts in uh, living tissues. In fact, the vitamins mm. and the things that derive from the vitamins. The, uh, so he was developing a field that was very important but very difficult. It transpired that his father-in-law, who liked Todd, of course, had been <laughs> President of the Royal Society, Order of Merit, <laughs> and Todd followed in. What was his father-in-law's name? Do you remember? Um, it doesn't matter, but um, if he's a famous royal president of the Royal Society, he wasn't a Todd as well. No, 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 no. I've lost it. Hmm. Well, I may fill in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, so you came to Cambridge with Todd, did you? 
Well, Todd had come in 44, I had turned up in 48. Mm. Started work, offered something to do, wasn't terribly interested, did a wee bit of something. Wait, was this in Bragg's laboratory or...? Where no, 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 this is in chemistry. Ah, Bragg right. was in, f in physics. Was it? Oh, right. Yeah. The way later on had more contact with the people in Bragg's laboratory mm. when we got to know mm. Francis Crick. Mm. Um, and I started working with Todd, or with Basil Lithgow, who was mm. actually a f teaching fellow here. Mm. The first year. In King's? When yeah, you I said was yeah. in Christ College. Yeah. I was you were attached. You were a fellow of Christ? I was attached. Not a fellow, mm -hmm. no. no. I, was, I, I became a graduate student, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. thinking my thesis was so bad, I thought I'll, <laughs> I'll do one in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, joined a college mm -hmm. for this purpose. Well, although I came to work with Todd, my first impressions of Cambridge, which I had never seen, never been to in all the years I was in London, I had never mm -hmm. been yet. I had no concept of the place. I arrived in Christ College with my friend Hugh Forrest, who had come from Glasgow and gone to the National Institute of Medical Research in London, so we were close friends. And we came here together. We landed in Christ College. I think maybe he got used to it more effectively than I did because he played rugger and mm. joined in the things that were important to Christ College at that time. Now, I found it, I found it a terrible institution. I mean, I really was very taken aback. Mm. Once living in London, uh, at least you could do what you wanted. <laughs> You learn things in a different way, and you suddenly found yourself being very like, um, you know, a student who might have come from a public school, right? and it was a finishing school for them. It wasn't a finishing school for me, it almost finished me off. If you like. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. Well, and then just to put it quite simply, I that finally didn't matter because I had joined a lab which was really on the up and up. It was going very strongly. There were people coming from over the several years from almost every country that you can think of, but lots were coming from Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. Ghana. Then the uh, then people from Europe, two very good Russians that uh, were allowed to come because Todd called who was it at the time? It didn't be God. It wasn't God. It was Khrushchev. That if they wanted to send somebody, they can send him but they're not going to have someone hanging about looking after them and keeping an eye on them. They're going to be part of the lab. Mm. <laughs> so we had very good contacts with two Russians. And so it was a very cosmopolitan department. And the work that Todd had done, he'd spent several years in, in um, Manchester, and had got a big school going, which was in a sense directed to vitamins and to the things that derived from vitamins and had connections with the nucleic acids. So I turned up at, a, at an interesting time. The nucleic acids were not discussed much because the work on coenzymes and the methods of phosphorylation, because that was the thing that Todd had started that brought him a Nobel Prize, uh, to develop methods of 
making compounds with phosphates, phosphate esters, phosphate diphosphates, triphosphates, ATP, and so on. But he hadn't got on to nucleic acids. And my reading of nucleic acids, or shall we say RNA, which was the thing that interested me, was, and I've looked at it a lot since, the situation was just uh, really quite chaotic. How the bits were joined together uh, to make any kind of reasonably large structure just not understood. And they were not understood for one reason. If I may put a wee bit chemistry in here, yeah. a nucleic acid was at least thought to be a chain mm. of things. This was for the genetic code and all the rest, but nevertheless it was a somewhat elongated thing. And for DNA, it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger as methods were developed to measure the size of it. But RNA was RNA was less stable, and um, the results that other people got were uh, were not telling them very much. When you have a thing that's a chain, you expect to be able to find the linkage points, or rather the linkage points between one and a phosphate and the next nucleoside. But the curious thing was that for 15 years, I think, before I got everyone believed that there was just one product that you got when you broke RNA down, as it was called. Adenylic 3' phosphate, uridylic 3' phosphate, they were all 3' phosphate. And then amazingly somebody in Oak Ridge, Waldo Korn. That's K-O-R-M, is it? Or Waldo Korn, is it? C-O-H-N. C-O-H-N, okay. Found you could use the methods that were used for separating metals, I mean, the mm -hmm. uranium business. Mm -hmm. it was, those days. You could use them for separating the nucleotides that you got from hydrolysis of RNA. And found, no, you didn't only get one, the three prime phosphate, you got two. And two of each of the four different kinds. And he sent Todd one, yeah, a pair of them. And I was the only one around the lab. And this is how I got in the business. I was the only one in the lab at that time. And he said, look, do you think you could just look at these and check them out? I think they must be the two prime and the three prime phosphates. And he said, well, we know the five prime phosphates because they've been known a while and we've synthesized them. We know the two prime phosphates because the chap, a chap in the lab the year before had synthesized the two prime phosphates and claimed they were different from the other two. So there's no doubt the three different possibilities were actually known and available. Just tell me which is which of these ones, these two that Waldo has sent us. And I spent the next year proving that the work of Todd and a friend, a friend of mine in the lab at the time, Mickelson, had synthesized was not the two prime phosphate, but was the same as the five prime phosphates that were well known. Work in some other lab had done the same kind of thing. I got their stuff, showed that the two prime phosphate, in fact, had not been synthesized. The question, therefore, was these two things must have been the two and the three phosphates, but which was which? 
Well, that started me in the business, and I started synthesizing them. I also started working with a so-called ester of these compounds, a benzyl ester, no less, nucleoside phosphate benzyl diester. And now that looked to me, you see, just like an inter-nucleotide linkage in RNA, or might be. So I took, I took these two prime, three prime things, the benzyl I. I talked to a friend of mine, a Frenchman, one evening in our digs. We talked about his work on phospholipids. And I woke up to the fact that night that the things that I had represented in the same sense as the chemistry he had been discussing with me in the lipids, phospholipids, my compounds might be analogues of the internucleotide linkage in RNA. I did the experiment the next day, showed that they hydrolyzed and did the right thing. I had got the idea. I knew how to find it. I explained, in fact, why there was always the phosphate was stuck at this end and it never showed up what was at this end. Well, there was a lot of work followed from 50, from about 1950 to 51, when we cleared up the whole business. And then it took a wee bit longer up to 56 to make sure that what we used to call the A and the B phosphates were in fact the two prime and three prime. So we actually, over that period of six years, um, by essentially doing no work on the natural product, i.e. RNA, but taking the literature, but using synthetic intermediates that derive from Todd's work on phosphorylation, we proved the basic structure of RNA. We didn't only do that by ourselves because we had to find some way of associating what we had done with, as it were, the reality, people, something people were working on with RNA itself. And the people were available. In fact, there were two people in, not in biochemistry, but in a department over in that neighborhood called Markham, Roy Markham, and John Smith, J.D. Smith. They were great workers, worked hard, drank a lot of beer at lunchtime, <laughs> worked hard, drank a lot of beer in the evening, and, were <laughs> and they published very rapidly. <coughs> and our work fitted exactly and explained some of the chemists, the things that they were observing. It was two-way. Now that was a that was a great period actually. Yeah, sounds very exciting. Yeah, I mean that was my uh, there's no doubt that was my best period. Mm -hmm. And of course it was, shall we say, for that reason, that though I was always supposed to be going back to the Chester Beatty, mm -hmm. Todd said, Do you want a job? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. The answer was yes. He not only he, he did something that in a sense surprised other people in that. He didn't just say, okay, you can become a demonstrator now, mm -hmm. start at the bottom. Because mm -hmm. if you remember then, but you don't remember. Yes, I do. But remember. then, a, a lectureship was a, something you could aim at yeah. and, and, and stay at. Yeah. And he made, he made me an assistant director of research, of which there were a few around uh, the university. It meant that I could carry on work without teaching, without demonstrating. And um, I got a huge
you would show my work done as a result. Uh, you, <laughs> it was very good. It had the mis unfortunate effect that I didn't learn how to teach at the kind of level, the early level, mm -hmm. and I never have been a good lecturer. Do you enjoy all the I don't enjoy yeah. lecturing, and I occasionally do it well, and often do it very badly. Mm. So, that's always been so. What about, um, have you done much college supervision? Well, when Todd gave me the job as ADR, Lithgow, who was in the department, left to go to Leeds, and I stepped in to become college lecturer. In King's? In King's, in chemistry. This was about mid-50s, was it all? This was 53, I think mm. it was. Well, most of my life at the time was spent in the lab. Mm. But I did do my supervision, my yeah. six hours or whatever. Mm. How did you find that? Did you quite enjoy that? I quite enjoyed that. Mm. Met up with mm. good types and mm. yeah, they were good students and who've done well. Mm. And um, what about um, this PhD supervision? Have you done much of that or supervising doctors? Well, yes. When I was in the lab and over the years, I think I think I'm about thirty odd. Really? People I've mm. looked after all the years. Mm. And that also you enjoyed? Well, that was my life, after mm. all. Mm. I mean, there's no question. Mm. Um, at the early bit that I talk was talking about, I was working on the bench solidly. Mm. Uh, but curiously, I came to this point having essentially got the general, general RNA structure right and how it hydrolyzes and therefore how enzymes hydrolyze it and the general structure of DNA which the general chemical structure which was not the same hmm. as uh, as the structure that uh, Francis Crick and, uh, and uh, Jim Watson were looking at they, they were looking at They weren't looking at the chemical structure, they were looking at how the, how the long chain is mm. organized and, and, uh, mm. and came up with the double helix. Um, no, but as soon as I had finished working that bit of RNA chemistry, the things that other people in the field were then beginning to do uh, were put in a more general sense, biochemistry. And they were learning, learning to use um, uh, radioactive intermediates. And I didn't want to do this. So I looked around for another subject, which was I called a super RNA problem, which were the phosphoinositides. And for a number of years I worked on that, but also worked on the hydrolysis of esters, of well, the phosphate esters, and we derived a lot of interesting uh, chemistry. You see, the theory of organic chemistry up to the time I was learning it at the university was almost all just carbon chemistry, making, breaking carbon bonds, and a lot of other things related. But suddenly people started looking at esters, carbonyl compounds, uh, and that opened up another realm that was in the, in the 40s, 50s. And then when Todd started on the phosphorus chemistry, that was another kind of chemistry almost. 
And so I, with one or two very, very fine people, one of whom was Neil Hamer, mm -hmm. who's in Trinity, but he was my research student and he was a Kingsman, so he sometimes appears here. He was very, very bright. And we discovered quite a lot of interesting things. So I was involved with phosphate ester chemistry and phosphorylation methodology. And that took me through my next period. And my next period, while I was now a fellow and, and mm -hmm. teaching here, and I c could talk about what I thought about the place. Yes, just briefly. <laughs> just, just briefly, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I found myself thrown into a, mm. in, in, into a mixture. There were about 60 fellows of mm. whom 50-odd were in residence, I guess. Um, Stockdale, and then, and of course, Annan had yeah. arrived a few years before, and um, I was told, yes, yeah, you dine three nights a week. Mm. You were married by this time to Margaret, were you? Well, having got a university job and become a teaching fellow. Mm we decided that we had we would be able to marry. Mm. <laughs> Very careful about that. <laughs> but mm. that was the right thing to do, I think. Mm. Actually I kept telling graduate student uh, research students, get your thesis before you get married. Mm. <laughs> well, um, so I did get to know all the people here, the ones you know, there was Beavis, mm. there was George Salt, Stockdale, I associated with a good deal, who looked after chemists. Edward Shire, Nicky Caldor, Lord Kahn, not Lord then maybe, but... Were there any I, that you were particularly fond of or got I, on, on well with? I got associated with, I don't know that I particularly liked him, a man called Kenneth Harrison. Hmm. He was, very, he was a biochemist, but he never did any biochemistry. Mm. And he finally lost his job, although the head of the department tried to mm. help him on. He was very good on the chapel windows. He mm. was interested in that, wrote a book on the subject. <sighs> what about Bernard or Edmund Leach? They or? came a little later, you yeah. see. Yeah. Yeah. Not very much later. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was at that point I was getting to know people mm -hmm. properly. And you like kings more than um, Christ. Than so. Christ, yes. But I guess Christ would be changing its ways. Mm, by then, yeah. yeah. But, it, but it, it, it does sound to me, from what people appear to say, that though they go to other colleges, I'm talking about students, if they had their choice, they'd come here. And how they, when they get this idea, I don't know. But uh, there is no question that this, you know, that this college is, in a real sense, different from most others. And that derives way back from the period of Shepherd, when he was a young man. Our poet, mm. R R Rupert, Rupert Brooke, Brooke mm. and a variety of these ones. Mm. Looking in, looking into them a bit, it was clear that this was uh, this had. Uh, they were different, and we're not just talking about the fact that they were homosexuals or mm. whatever. They were different in a very general fashion, and I think that feeling of uh, that you could think and do things which were normally out, uh, outside the normal run of uh, how you lived and, uh, and uh, within your college. Uh, so it was different from 
Christ College, certainly in my time, because it was a very strict place. This ceased to be. And of course, you will know the background, of course, there's no point in me discussing the questions of bringing in women uh, at an early stage, the work that Jim Turner did to arrange this, which was not easy. So the other the women's colleges were not put out. Mm. And well, these are matters I, I didn't wasn't involved in, but in favour of. So this was a place I became used to, but I think well, it's very difficult really to be uh, in any sense sure about this, that I did as well and possibly better by learning my initial uh, university studies in Glasgow rather than here, that we taught each other and we read uh, in our subject, whereas in Cambridge, the relationship of the university, uh, I'm talking then about the lab, for instance, and the college, were orthogonal to each other. and led to a situation where you finished work at 12.30 or 1, you shot over to the college for lunch and then you shot back again. Meanwhile, your uh, other colleagues in the lab did exactly the same into their college. The students that you, that you taught here came to supervision here, but you didn't teach people in other colleges. The college operation in the teaching sense was distinct from here, from that in other colleges, and the interaction of the students in your subject at least was, was cut apart by people heading off to their own college at lunchtime, supper time, and the like. As my work after what I was telling you was concerned, one very important situation occurred, i.e. the appearance in 1959, I think, of Sidney Brenner. Mm -hmm. Now my chemistry had kept moving me away from the center of chemistry as it, one might define it in the department. And it was moving very far, very much in the direction of the kind of things that Sidney involved himself in. And so I got interested in, in chemistry associated with genetics. And that built up, I went back to nucleic acids again. My students went and worked in the MRC, Molecular Biology Lab. I didn't see them quite often, for a long time, and um, slowly I moved over there so that when I came to have a sabbatical and then retire, in effect, I retired a little early, I went and worked there. I had therefore two uh, careers, one in chemistry, and in, one in molecular biology, although no my molecular biology biologist would call me a molecular biologist, <laughs> I always called an organic chemist. But that fitted, that worked very well until rather recently, I mean, you know, a year ago. Uh, though now I find I can quite happily drop all that and become domesticated. Uh, that's that aspect of my career. Of the people that work with me, one I think I would like to mention, his name was 
whose very dimension, Srinivasan, very dimension. How do you spell this? <laughs> Varadarajan. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. His father hmm. was a lawyer, a blind lawyer, in Bangalore, who was part of the, what is the word that was used, Gandhi, used peaceful resist mm, resistance. He yes. uh, was part of that, his father did go to jail occasionally for this, but uh, there was then derived from that period a group of, well, I just call them sons of the people that were associated with the peaceful mm -hmm. resistance kind of thing. And Ranchin was one of them. But there were quite a few in Cambridge at that time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they are now you know, reaching 80, 80, mm. and whatever. And that uh, most important generation, in my opinion, is, is now disappearing in India. Now, I, not much of a traveler, but I've been to India several times, five times, I guess. Rajan did incredibly well, a huge amount of work, and took the view that if India was going to become, take on more commercial, uh, industrial work, then it had to do it, it had to haul itself up by its own bootstraps. Because Britain, although since the end of the First World War, knew it was going to have to leave India, you know. It took it too long to do so, but it was still holding back on letting India uh, get into a, a proper industrial frame of mind. And Rajan did that for the petrochemical business, for engineers India, learning new stuff by themselves, being able to sell it to the, the Dubai and 